Hey guys, Montel here, and thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And I am so excited about having the guest on that we have today. Most of you will know my guest from uh, really today from his starting starring role in the long running series, The Walking Dead. His character on the show, Jerry, brings some much needed comic relief to the zombie apocalypse series. When he's not on the set, you're likely to find him at a fan convention passing out one of his favorite things that he makes himself his favorite cobbler. Cooper Andrews, great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel today, sir. Oh, thank you. It's happy to be here. Absolutely. Look, this is really kind of crazy, man. We'll go back a little bit. Let's go back in time. Tell me where you grew up at and, and uh, how you got your start. Let's, let's start. Where'd you grow up at? Yeah, uh, I, was, I was born in Long Island, uh, New York. And then uh, my mom, she has a uh, she's a pension actuary. So she moved down the East Coast. So I lived in Jersey till I was nine, then Maryland, Towson, Maryland till I was two, and then uh, Atlanta, Georgia for pretty much the rest of it, unless I had to go work somewhere. But yeah, I like to think of myself as a Southerner. <laughs> wow, I was a, I'm a Maryland boy. I'm uh, from Baltimore originally, so uh, we have a little bit in common there. But uh, yeah. you have you have a really uh, the, your background is so interesting to me, especially your lineage. You you are Samoan and. Um, and Jewish, yeah. And Jewish, which is really kind of a unique pair pairing, right? Yeah, it's uh, my mom was in the Peace Corps, um, and when so when she was 22, 23, they uh, they had her go to Samoa, and that's where she met my dad. And then <laughs> a year later, she came back, and um, I was the souvenir. <laughs> well, there you go, good souvenir, though. You yeah. were raised Jewish, yes, yes. So, are you practicing now, or yeah, you... I mean, it's I. I as much as I, I like to think a lot of my uh, my friends, uh, my friends and I have. So we, we celebrate the high holidays and um, we'll do, uh, you know, we'll do Passover dinners and, and stuff like that. But I don't go to shul every weekend. No, you know, it's, it's just it's very interesting is I, I just I can't imagine you going into a synagogue and people going, huh? I mean, <laughs> I mean you do you favor being more Samoan. So, yes. Yeah. yeah a, a big, big guy, my friend. Yes. <laughs> um you know, uh, I, I found something else interesting about your background. You know, your mom started you kind of dabbling in the martial arts when you were age three. Is that right? Yes. yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, she was, uh, my mom was afraid that, um, how can I say this? Not in a weird way. My, so my dad, when he was younger, he was, he, uh, he drank. And so he'd be, uh, he would get abusive sometimes. And she was afraid I would have uh, that that anger streak um mm. that he had at, uh so she wanted to put me in martial arts early to help you know if i had any temper issues just how to you know control it and how to focus and stuff and uh and so that did it, calm uh, you down a bit right i mean right it does just, it does you know it, and and what, sometimes it just feels good to punch a bag and other times it just feels good to just just sort of push everything out and just uh uh you know just clear your head um so the martial arts the uh has always helped with that throughout the years yeah yeah it's one of those things especially when you know you're a big guy like you i mean most of the time people feel like they have to challenge big guys like you but i think that you know <laughs> knowing that you have martial arts skills behind that size makes you a little bit more reticent to say dude back off right i i i, I wish that was the way uh, <laughs> when you get into the uh i was a i was a bartender and a bouncer um uh um early 20s and and uh there'd always be someone who goes you know what i could beat you up i'm like <laughs> hi why <laughs> and then all of a sudden they wake up to reality and they just got their ass whipped while they land on the ground right <laughs> yeah well yeah it'd be usually from someone hearing that and defending me so i've had friends who are smaller and they would just jump on somebody uh for that kind of talk so That's it's great. always nice to be supported <laughs> Now, you know, you you didn't grow up thinking that you wanted to be in this field of being an actor in the entertainment field. Um, you know, what what got you, what led you down the path of uh, working in entertainment? Uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to do, starting in high school, I guess, um, I wanted to do uh, stunts and fight choreography and fight coordinating. And um, and so, I, I you know, I've, I've learned different weapons throughout the years and, you know, still practice. And. I just want to be able to sort of tell a story uh, through these movements and through these 
uh, you know, just through two people interacting, you know, you know, in a destructive way, but also it just makes it fun. Cause when I watch a movie, I like to be, I like my belief to be completely suspended. Um, I don't want, so I, I mean, I love, I love all movies, but the ones I like to be a part of are the ones that take me out of, uh, reality. Um, then you must be being a martial arts fan. You've got to be a huge fan of, uh, Keanu Reeves and, uh, John Wick, right? Oh I mean, yeah. They, they, they created a whole new style. They, they call that gun kata, didn't they? Uh, I think Gun Kata was actually uh, um, uh, Christian Bale in Equilibrium. Um, oh, okay. And it had this thing where he would like shoot from here and then he would have all these different poses. And uh, and the idea was like how to shoot the most people while being the smallest target. Right. Uh, and John Wick was, they might be calling that for John Wick as well. The Just that style of just everyone walking through. No, no not only that, but I really, I mean, when you, you know, I, I probably catch myself watching John Wick Oh man, each one of them, you know, three or four times each. And, you know, if you, you watch them from number one to number three, his progression in his ability to turn a gun into a move that was a martial arts move at the same time that he's pulling the trigger at the same time that he's taking the gun apart. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's really, that that's a step in the right direction. I think for, you know, wowing people. Right. Oh, I love it. I love that stuff. Cause it, it, it you know, you get to, the the thing I always liked about fights uh, and, and stunts was just the collateral damage um, was just every unnecessary thing getting destroyed just because they could. And, uh, you know, when you have your weapon and then it then it itself becomes this thing where it's like, all right, we're going to take it apart and I'm going to, you know, use every part of it as a weapon is is super fun. Absolutely. Uh, and creative, you know. It's yeah, especially cool. getting to use your body, every single part of your body as a weapon also, right? Oh, yeah. It's just always, you know, I, I like that. It's always, if they got him, he's like, like hit him with his head, find the quickest thing to like stick yeah. something into somebody. Oh, that's gotta be so much fun. So now, so you started off in high school working in, you did a whole bunch of independent films by yourself, right? Little films for yourself and some friends. Yeah. With, with friends, everything, uh, and that's why I like Atlanta. Everything was, uh, you know, making movies with friends and, you know, someone would say, Hey, this guy has a camera and an idea. It's like, well, then what are we waiting for? Let's go. <laughs> right. So, all right. So, you did that in high school, and then you got your foray into the entertainment community, Hollywood wise, as a sound coordinator, right? As a boom operator. Yes. Yes. Um, we were uh, during one of the indies in Atlanta, we were shooting this. Um, it was supposed to be like an homage to like uh, German expressionist film. Uh, so, it was this black and white. Uh, movie about this uh, witch who became a queen, and uh, and it's it's called Golgotha. I don't think it ever got released. I just moved the whole camera here, but um, the uh, the sound mixer was like, "Hey, I need you were just swinging a spear. Would you mind holding this stick above your head?" Uh, I was like, "Sure." And then it became a game because getting good sound, you know, and that's the biggest thing that takes us out of uh, takes us out of movies that we don't realize is how important sound is. Oh my goodness! Oh, yeah. does it? Does it, does it I won't let you continue that thought? But I got to tell you, one of the things that drives me absolutely nuts right now is that you know they're producing so much content for all these streaming services. I really think somebody needs to jump in there and scream and say to these guys, "Remember, the sound is as important as what you shoot." Yes. Because, I, 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 and, and maybe it's because of the final mix. I mean, first off, the number of times I've seen a boom in a shot. And some of these streaming uh, uh, projects, I, I, it cracks me up. Um, the number of times I've seen the microphone sticking up out of a tie, it cracks me up. Yeah. But what really bothers me is like I literally have to hold a remote in my hand throughout the entire project to raise and lower the volume. You know, they 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 are doing really such poor mixing jobs when it comes to dialogue. And they blast the, you know, the engines, or they blast the gunfire, or they blast the, you know. I, I know you have a, a a dog at home. I've got one at home, and I tell you, he will be calm as as no can be. Then all of a sudden, bah, 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 you know, and it's like I, I didn't turn that up. You know what I mean? <laughs> does that drive you crazy? It does. It really does. And I'll hear things. Um, uh, we call it like presence. So if you have a love, uh, and someone's really far away and then it sounds like this hello there how's it going it sounds hi. really weird to me yeah um, and yeah i'm always i'm constantly no higher lower and 
no one notices it. So like, and you were talking about the uh, microphone getting in the shot. There will be uh, there will be camera uh, camera ops whose shot is getting ruined, like they didn't like something or something will be out of focus. So they'll actually tilt the camera up to catch the boom, uh, so that they can redo the shot and just say the boom was in the shot. Oh, uh, that's, that's Jack, the man. He blamed the boom operator, right? Yeah, get thrown under the bus. It's like every that's time. crazy, man. I mean, I do a lot. I'm still shooting a, a couple of shows right now myself, and you know, we we are fortunate enough that I I'm in a sound stage in a studio where I don't need to have, we don't need a boom uh, that often. But you know, when right. I go out on location, you know, in the last couple of uh, location uh, events we've been at, it's like you know, you get that 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 perfect take, and all of a sudden they say, no, got to do it again. The boom was in shot. What are you talking about? The boom was in shot. You know, now I know there's probably a camera operator ready to throw you under the bus, right? <laughs> and that one it might be the boom up, but it can happen. Always, I always look. I'm like, who looks guilty? Ooh. Who's looking guilty? <laughs> yeah, who's got that look on their face? Yeah. So now, when, so so you're you're operating as a as a boom operator, and then when did you get your first shot at being a principal actor in a project yourself? Ooh, the um, well, but post high school stuff. Yeah, yeah. The there was this. They were reshooting. Um, this was back in 2006, um, and they were reshooting Revenge of the Nerds. And this was my first. They, <laughs> I'm finding it a little suspect. All right, so I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So I was. This was a. It was featured. It was a featured background role, um, which I had no clue. This is I, I had no clue any of this stuff. And uh, they have a trailer for me, and my name is Nitrous. And then they told me that there would be dialogue for me at the end of filming. Uh, so I, the, the movie got canceled. The, the movie got the middle of shooting. It, it, it wow. stopped. But I remember thinking later on, I was like, oh, so the idea was they would hire me on as an actor for the last two days, but then pay me as a uh, as featured background uh, for the rest of the time. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot That's of stuff nice. things that were happening on that production. Wow. Um, so that was my first one. That was 2006. Then um, I did, <laughs> I did a, Coke, a Coca-Cola Zero commercial, um, uh, which got me an agent. Uh, but then I just realized I wanted to learn. Like, to me, acting is, I love acting. It's a ton of fun. And, I, you know, I love the experiences of it. But um, I just wanted to know technically how everything worked. I wanted to know how, like, lighting and, and camera and sound and i wanted to um be able to figure out how all these things work together to make the big picture i didn't um i wanted to be able to contribute more than just uh than just acting um or just stunts uh when coming in uh when looking forward career-wise uh for projects i wanted to see uh what i can do what i can learn and what i can do differently uh to kind of help me understand a little more so like mm -hmm. when i was a uh so when you learn the sound and you learn all the technical stuff, things like acting, when they're like, hey, I need you to, you know, you'll land here. It's like, oh, can I have you step to your right? Okay, step back to your left. You know, and those little things when they're like, can you step to your right? Perfect. You know, and you yeah. just learn these little these little tricks that just help, uh, that just help later on. All this technical stuff I had learned helped with the acting. Um, but there was a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of things I want to learn, uh, in this, you know, in this industry. So, uh, as much as I can learn and whenever I can, I'll, I'll, I'll take the lessons. Gotcha. Yeah. So now what was it after you got the, the, uh, what was it you said, um, Diet Coke commercial after that, what was your next first role or next big role? Um, my, so what, what started getting me into things was, uh, the show called halt and catch fire. And it was also on AMC, like the walking dead is, and it was about, uh, it took place in the 80s, and it was sort of about uh, how computers became the way they are now. Mm -hmm. um, our first season, we're making a laptop. Uh, season two, we're uh, sort of working on chat rooms um, and how to make that happen. On um, season three, I think they were, we were doing um, uh, essentially eBay, uh, just people being able to buy and share. And then I was in, in season four, I went over to Walking Dead. In season four, they... Uh, um, they do, they just sort of complete it all and, and just sort of, and it goes, follows these four characters. But I started with that show. Um, 
and it was a drama and there was some there's some amazing actors in that show and i was just uh i would sit in the chairs and i would just watch the screens because now i was allowed to you know i was mm-hmm. allowed to be there um <laughs> and when i was a boom operator it was my i loved that position because I would always be in the room with the director. I'd always be in the room with the actors and, the, and, and when they would have their, just their private rehearsals and discussions. And I would just, I would just listen and pay attention. And then when I was off of set, I would take my cans off and I would leave that boom in there because mm-hmm. there's too many stories of people walking around with their microphone and just getting in trouble. So sure. like, I don't want anyone thinking that's me. <laughs> right. No, so that's good. So then, so now, I mean, were you approached by the walking dead to come over to that show or how did that happen? I mean, being a part of A&E, I guess they they saw your skills and decided, hmm, this would be a great character. Yeah. So on uh um uh we had I had done an audition in the past for Walking Dead and the showrunner at the time, he's now head of content, uh Scott Gimple, um he had remembered my audition from two years prior and they had written this when I read the sides for this audition uh for Jerry, I thought it was just a I thought the dialogue was uh, sort of like fake dialogue, you know, like that they just give to you. Um, and part of it was, you know, I, instead of dealing with the tiger, like I do in the show, I was dealing the, there was a dog uh, in the, uh, in the audition. And I'm just thinking, this is my dialogue. This can't be real dialogue. <laughs> it's like, I, you know, there's a line where I'm like, chill it up, best chill it up. <laughs> and because of the dog was Santiago and the tiger is Shiva. So I actually still kept that dialogue. I'm like, am I actually talking to a tiger like that? And it was a big throw to me because such a big fan of the walking dead. And this is, this is a character where, you know, I was just like, where is this guy coming from? Uh, and it was one of those things where it's it one of those characters where I felt like I had to 100% commit to him just being able to sort of be this happy presence. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't want to, I felt like if I didn't go full 100% into this person, that the character might come off weird. And I was afraid people were just going to hate him. I was like, oh. Right. But people wound up loving this character and they love you to death, my friend. Did you have you guys, you guys continue to tape during COVID, did you not? Yes. Yeah. So we, they, uh, uh, we did six COVID episodes, which were extra uh, kind of like backstory uh, episodes. Um, well, let's go back to that for a second, because when you yeah. when you started those, the dead night, I mean, I, I think you must have experienced a little trepidation of your own thinking, I don't know if I want to go down to a set with all these knuckleheads and nobody's wearing a mask and, you know, people aren't really behaving the way they're supposed to, or were people behaving the way they were supposed to? They were, Walking Dead was amazing about this. Um, they they really were. Uh, we would, so before, before anyone can get on set, everyone had to do uh, three separate uh, PCR tests. Um, and then on the day we would do a PCR and a rapid test. We still do that. Um, we all wear, uh, trackers, uh, fobs. And it, it's, it's, it sounds at first it sounded scary, but it was really like, so if someone had, uh, if someone had COVID, it would see who this person was hanging with and where they were, they wore. And if they were, you know, and, but everyone's been keeping, um, the, the six foot distance. We mostly shoot outside, um, the but everyone wears glasses uh uh n95s um and just kept our distance so everything was really safe but it was weird because uh we were when we did these covid episodes uh uh me and uh um uh uh two other actors were the first doing these uh doing the covid episodes and so it was super long lenses and it felt like it kind of felt a little bit like John Wick in one moment where everyone will just spread out around you. So you just sort of like, as you walk forward, everyone walks back and they maintain, they keep you know, equal distance uh, like of a circle. So if I'm here in the middle, you know, if I'm here, everyone just keeps <laughs> drifting along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was, it definitely was weird um, at first, but we all love what we do. Um, and so we were just like, okay, we're gonna, it's a lot of air hugs, a lot of like far away punches, uh, like fist bumps from afar. Uh, and then we just, uh, you know, we just tried to do our best to, to keep the distance. And there hasn't been any, um, any cases from the, uh, uh, from set. Are you still shooting now or no? Yes. You're shooting now? Yeah. We're going until March. 
we started you're, shooting in February and we were going till March of 2022. Yeah. This is what season 12, right? Uh, it, it, it's season 11. Um, but this would have been within the season 12 year, but this is, this is technically season 11. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, I mean, you know, there's 11 seasons of a of a series of any type is like a long, long, super long run. I mean, I, I, I was blessed to get a 17 years for my talk show. Yeah. And, you know, but when it comes to dramatic series, come on, man. 11 years is like a super long time. 12 years is a super long time. How many more years do you think you guys got? Um, as far as our main show goes, this is our final season. So season 11 is our final season, but we're going to have – there's a new show coming out. Um, we have some uh, uh, movies coming out. Uh, there's two other, uh, and then there's two other current spinoffs, uh, Fear of the Walking Dead and Walking Dead World Beyond. Um, and then there's, actually, sorry, there's gonna be two new shows coming out, apparently, and then uh, uh, and then the movies. So, though the main show is gonna be gone, they're gonna, Walking Dead, I think, is gonna have some life in it for quite a while. Absolutely, I think, you know, um... You know, you guys got a really huge boost from that uh, movie that Brad Pitt was in, um, uh-huh. Z, World War Z. Yeah, and so I, I can see why they would want to go ahead and do a movie about you rather than about that. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, I, yeah. It, it's you. It's. Are it's you in the movie? About, say again. Are you going to be in the movies? Um, don't think so. I don't think I'll be in those movies. But the um, we don't know. Pretty much anyone that's on our show right now, we do not know what will happen. That's been the one thing that's never changed. We never know. It's wow. Like everything feels good. And then they're like, hey, so um, this is going to be your last episode. And you're like, <laughs> cool. Thank you. <laughs> uh, man, that's 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 terrible getting that down. And it's, what's been the one thing that you've loved the most about this show? Oh, my goodness. Um, the uh, From working on the show, it's – you can't, I mean, the the actors that we get for this show have to be able to handle uh, the extreme temperatures while wearing the long jackets. Um, and we all, there's this thing that they go on about, like called the Walking Dead family. And we are all very, very close with each other. And sometimes we, uh, sometimes we're, we're loving every moment. And sometimes we're just covered in, you know, dirt, having things like, rattle us a little bit and then we love that too it's but it's uh it takes an intensity um and as a boom operator i was on so many so many shows uh and this and walking dead is the one where it doesn't feel like there's a like a like a i don't know i want to call it like a divide you know like sometimes it feels like the actors we stay separated from everyone else um and this one it feels like everyone is immersed everyone gets along like uh if I want to, you know, I'll have my camera friends a little bit. Hey, Cooper, just twist your head a little bit. And when you look over, you know, and then it'll just, they'll just help out with shots. Uh, you know, if there's like a, a, you know, if like props are running out, you know, or running out of time and we're running out of daylight, you know, you'll see actors like putting their things back and, and trying to just help as, as much as we can. It's a super helpful set. Um, we all love being there and it, it's just sort of fun to feel like these dirty badasses. Uh, we're always covered. <laughs> Always covered in dirt or blood. Oh, <laughs> crazy. Crazy. Now, off the set, off the set, you spent a lot of time visiting with fans at fan conventions and things, right? Yes, yes. And somebody told me that you you are a baker of your own, uh, uh, right? You you work on, you make cobbler? I do, yes. Tell me um, about this. Where did this start? So uh, my character, uh, <laughs> uh, when, our, when our, our characters are first introduced on the show, and this is in the beginning of season seven, uh, one of the main characters at the time, she was like, oh, it still is uh, uh, Melissa McBride, but she goes, you guys have cobbler? And one of the people are like, we have cobbler at every meal. And uh, there's this scene where I'm eating, I'm eating peach cobbler, which looked great. It was just, you're just <laughs> chugging corn syrup. And you're like, oh, my throat's burning. Right, uh, yeah. Mm. Right here. And, mm. uh, uh, but my mom, uh, she makes for my birthday, she makes this thing called uh, a raspberry mountain pie and, uh, it's a raspberry cobbler and first convention I'd ever done. I was like, you know what? I think cobblers need to be brought. Cause I know how conventions are. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of things and 
you know, people wait in these lines for a long time. So when people show up, I always have cobbler (laughs) waiting for them uh, and they're eating it. So uh, if they're in Atlanta, I will make, oh, geez, Uh, but it's not just me. It's uh, me and my wife, my mom. uh, uh, We will make uh, 60 cobblers or so. Wow. Stacks. And I just, and they'll all be gone. They'll all be gone and we'll just give it out to people and, um, you know, I'll, and my favorite is when uh, uh, little kids, when you give them cobbler and they're like, I don't know. It's like, give it a shot. Like, <laughs> it's good. And they don't <laughs> more, but <laughs> they're yeah, reluctant yeah. to say they love it. <laughs> and they got to be surprised coming from you, right? Oh, yeah. It's 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 always fun. I'm, I, I always be like, you're really not going to eat cobbler that I'm giving you? That, and they're like, <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> especially that you made huh oh yeah i made this i was up to, and i'll you know i'll be up there'd be there'd be days where um i gotta stop kicking this thing um there'll be days where i would uh uh we would film uh we'd be filming to maybe like 3 a.m 4 a.m i'd get home i'd start baking cobbler um so that i would be ready uh by the next morning um and i would you know i'd get maybe like an hour of sleep because i want to be like i gotta make the cobbler I gotta make the cobbler to take it to the set, take yeah. Well, to, to take it to the uh, to the fan conventions. Gotcha. Um, and I'll you know I'd, I'd actually I, I brought uh, I brought I'd bring cobbler at the at the end of the season. I'll bring cobbler uh, for everyone to eat. Um, so it was, <laughs> I just like feeding people. Oh, that's sure. fun. fun. Got to be fun. Yeah. Well, that's the what is the quickest way to a person's heart, right? Through their stomach. Yes. <laughs> there you go for sure. So now now you have become a cannabis advocate, right? Yes. Yes. And and what what got you? You're, and I, I don't say it being uh, with any kind of uh, you know aspersion. You're a little later to the game. You didn't yeah. start experiencing can- cannabis until what about three years ago, four years ago? Uh, I, I actually always equate to after my first season of Walking Dead. So I was 31, about uh, 31, uh, a few months shy of 32 when I uh, when I started doing cannabis, and it was. <laughs> There's a few things that were happening, but uh, mainly um, I had pulled, I pulled a hamstring. So it's a little funny story, but uh, uh, my buddy on the show, Kari Payton, super fast. And we're running after these bad guys. And I, and I used to run (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh, we sprinting. I'll show you a sprint. One, two, three. And then I'm like limping. And there's this massive bruise, just super painful. And, um, uh, at that point I was like, you know what? I'm just, you know, I don't like, I'm, I'm, I don't want to put any more like Advil's or Tylenol's in my mouth. I'm just, and, uh, you know, started smoking. Um, and how relaxed it got me. Now, the thing about, the thing about, uh, uh, the thing about where marijuana in my mind is that a lot of people want to just use it and think it's by itself, um, when it comes to certain healing, um, not all things, but when it comes to certain healing that if you just do, if you just smoke, then it's going to fix it. But it allows your head to sort of focus on what you need to, what you need to take care of in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's some information that's come out, some really recent studies that talks about yeah. the fact that not only does it have a physiological effect, but it has more of a psychological effect, not necessarily reducing the pain physiologically, but it allows your brain to deal with and cope with the pain in a different way. So therefore it lets you heal faster because you recognize that you're in pain. It's not so overwhelming, but then you will go about doing the things that you need to do to make the pain subside. Like you'll ice down. I I know people who will tell me that they will, you know, if they, if they smoke a little bit, they can ice for three or four hours rather than just, you know, 15 minutes. Yeah. You can, you can, you can take it a little more and it, and also because say uh, it, was, it was my hamstring, but let's say it was like an injury here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, when without without weed, it would feel like all of this hurts. I'm like, oh, this all hurts. But then as I as I'm more affected, I'm like, oh, it's right here. This is the area. This is sore, but this is all secondary. The source the source is here, um, and you're able to if you can just look listen past everything and some you know you know whenever you know i tell people uh when they get to that moment it's like well i can't focus it's like you have to try 
like there's some there's some fun that can definitely happen but if you can focus on what it's actually trying to do for you right now you can really heal yourself a lot faster calm yourself um uh in ways that i didn't think i could you know you know just with anxiety and just uh just pressures that you don't know where they're coming from you don't know why it's coming but then when you uh the same with the pain you can start compartmentalizing everything um if you can just listen to what your body is telling you with the help of uh cannabis you know? yeah very very perceptive i mean you're, you're absolutely right i mean i think a lot of people think that you know just by consuming cannabis all of a sudden you lose your brain you're not gonna be able to focus you're not gonna be able to think yeah. you know you're really running off but honestly if you train your mind while on cannabis to continue to focus you almost hyper focus yeah um and and that's the reason why they've they've there's been several studies about people who drive um, and I'm not recommending it to any of my listeners that are watching, but you know, there's a lot of studies out there that talk about the fact that people actually who are consuming cannabis have less car accidents than people who are consuming alcohol because it does make you hyper focus. And one of the things that most cannabis driver, per cannabis people who drive do is drive a little bit too slow. They will drive slower because they're paying attention to everything that's going on, making sure that they don't miss something. Right. Yeah. And, and everything's like, no, 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 I'm staying on these lines. I'm looking at these lines. Um, it reminds me of, uh, um, uh, it was a black sheep, uh, with Chris Farley. It's like, do you know how the cop pulls him over? Like, you know how fast you're going? 64, 70, seven, <laughs> seven <laughs> miles an hour. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's funny cause I, I, uh, I, I have admitted it and talked to people. I probably, um, I've not gone a day since 2001 and a half without using cannabis myself. And. You know, I've done multiple dramatic series with uh, appearances and people have asked me, well, how do you remember your lines? And it's really weird. But, you know, uh, if I'm not on cannabis, I don't remember them that well. But when I am on cannabis, I just think they're like that. Because, again, you hyper focus, you hyper you you think to yourself, oh, I don't want to list this. So therefore, you study a little bit harder and you focus in on it hard enough that it comes right out when you when you go to deliver. That's actually yes. Uh, um I learned so many lines I've learned, um, certain performances I've been, uh, you know, not, I don't always do it when I'm filming, but depending on what it is, um, sometimes, cause there's, you take, I mean, there's a level where even now, if you take, you know, three hits, it's not, it, it's different. I, I tell, if you can get yourself to a level where one hit isn't going to affect your mind too much and it's just, it's in you, I, I, I explain it, uh, like it's like taking your vitamins, you know, you don't, I don't eat, you know, a whole bunch of Flintstone gummy chews though. That would be delicious. The, I do the, I'll just do, you know, like a hit. And then it's like, okay, that just brings it down. Um, I'm doing a project right now that I, I, I can't talk about, but I'm super excited about, but i um, uh, doing a cartoon right now. And sometimes before I go in your, your throat, uh, you know, just to get range, um, I'll do, uh, I'll maybe take, you know, one or two and then it's, I'll feel more relaxed. And then it just lets me be able to get to these highs and lows uh, within a performance. Absolutely. I mean, well, I mean, we can look back in time and look at some of the most creative people in our history, even Albert Einstein. I mean, you know, people use cannabis way more than people think. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, you know, all yeah. of our forefathers. Oh, know, yeah, for sure. Things. So people need to understand that, you know, it doesn't, it, matter of fact, it, it probably accentuates creativity. And um, especially when you look on the music industry, come on, you know, music and science over the course of the last 50 years. I mean, I think that's where a lot of that creativity comes from. It allows you to focus but also be creative and think outside of your own little narrow space. I believe, uh, yes, I, I, I believe it takes out, um, unless you're already, su unless you have a really big ego, but I do believe it takes out kind of any ego you have. Um, I love playing piano, not good at it, but I play it every day. Um, and I got over the, the missteps i, I want to get angry about it it's like okay it still sounds cool how can we make that better you know and you just you'll try and focus on you know just trying to work a few you know a few chords and and, and notes and it 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 takes out that um that aggression and that you might have with yourself that frustration that you'll get uh in, uh, like example like if you're like trying to fold like little bits of paper or whatever and then it's, it's just not doing it right 
that's a story in itself, but, <laughs> but, mm. uh, uh, but meticulous things, you know, things that you might, that might normally frustrate you. Um, uh, marijuana takes that out. It, it, and what, before you actually use it, what were your, what were some of your attitudes about it before you use it? How about or, oh, when you were growing up? What was the attitude about it? Oh man, I was, uh, um, I did not inform myself. I was completely against it. Um, I was, uh, mainly because it was illegal. Um, that was my, my, my biggest, my biggest thing. And it, I was afraid, I, you know, and, and the people that did it, uh, uh, you know, when I was in high school and everything, they were, you know, they'd have the hoodies up, they'd be in a corner, they'd be skipping class, they'd be smoking out of a dirty soda can. And it just always looked really unattractive on how they did it. I'm like, is this what you want it to, like, I don't want to be that. Um, but I realized just who, you know, at my age, that was my worldview of it. You know, I, you know, the, the kids that skip class and, uh, you know, would just go out by, you know, by a tree and like, just smoke under, you know, smoke under out of a soda can. They'd all be huddled up and it was, they always looked sick. They always looked tired and it just, it just made me want to, you know, I was like, Oh, I never want to, I never want to do that. Um, and then it became the more I got into uh, into Hollywood, the more I realized I'm like, oh wow, that person, that person smokes weed, and the, and I realized that you know, I had people start teaching me. It's like it's not about getting messed up. It's not about it's not about that, you know, which can be fun. But like, I never liked. I, don't know, I, I even now I probably drink maybe once a year. Um, at this point, I'm not, I've I've never liked alcohol. Um, again, uh, bringing back you know from my dad. Um, when he was younger and, uh, you know, my, just, I was afraid of something happening when I drank and, um, and with, uh, uh, but with, with weed, you know, I was, I was so nervous of also becoming, you know, like maybe I don't, you know, all the, you know, the ideas I want, I want to work in film. I want to be able to do stunts. I want to be able to do all these things, but weed might hold me back. And, um, and I think you have to have a little bit of understanding of yourself, um, before you start before you start using it um i think is what what helped me kind of with my mindset uh yeah i mean i think if people, if people come to it not because they're trying to escape something but they're trying to accentuate something yeah. or trying to find out more about themselves i think that's a whole different approach if you're going to weed to, to cannabis because you're trying to avoid things or trying to yeah. cover things up i think that's where some of the problems are and and you know and then you know, that perception that has been this stereotype perception of people who smoke has been around for such a long time that even though there are way more people out there than we think of that you know of, that you could even consider some of the top business people in this country are consumers of cannabis. And, and but yet they're afraid to speak out because they don't want to have people stigmatize them, but they still use it. And, right. you know, so there's the, it's not that that devil lettuce that people used to call it right <laughs> it will not yeah it's not there to corrupt it, it is a thing though where um like like you like you just brought up you know when people try to escape with it and they try to hide uh from their problems using using cannabis that's when problems start really arising uh people that get oh they're always like oh i'm so paranoid you know, I always get so paranoid. It's like, well, let's talk about that. What's going on that's making you paranoid in, in general? And, and they're probably the person that was paranoid whether or not they were doing cannabis or not. Yeah. That's there's a lot of that I've always, whenever I, I meet somebody who says, oh, it just makes me so paranoid, I think to myself, well, you were always paranoid anyway. I thought that was going to relax you a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, but again, if you enter the equation and enter the conversation saying, you know what, I am going to let this try to calm me down. Rather than enter the conversation saying, I think if I smoke that, I'm going to get really, really paranoid. You set your brain up for being paranoid. Yeah, for sure. And and it's, and that's when I tell people, um, then don't, you know, you don't, it's like, I, and, and, you know, whenever, I, and it's funny to me, because I, if I ever offer marijuana to somebody, I never do it as a, hey, you want marijuana? It's more of a, oh, I'm making some tea. Would you like to smoke as well? And and people always get uh oh no thank you I'm like it's cool I'm not I'm not I don't need to share it it's fine <laughs> you know? right yeah absolutely I'm I'm not forcing nothing I'm not gonna force a good time on you yeah exactly <laughs> right. 
And, well, and okay, we're, we're almost out of time. So I want to know, is, is there anything you're working on that you can talk about that you want to tell us what's going on? Well, in, in a few weeks, we start up Shazam 2. Um, and I'm super excited about that because uh, uh, we have uh, Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu uh, are, have joined the cast. Um, Shazam? Yes. Wait. You were I that wow, I forgot you were in that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, I like that movie. It was great. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, there's like, Shazam 2 is coming. Shazam 2 is coming. It's uh it it's it's bringing out more of the family. It's there's uh there's a lot of fun stuff, but it's made with really, really good people. Um I, I've been very lucky career wise that I've worked with so many really friendly uh just really sweet people um the only thing i'm disappointed is all those kids are gonna be taller than me <laughs> that's all right yeah <laughs> that's that's happening you're filming that now uh yeah we start in two weeks yeah that's cool and then anything else you anything else on the plate we got well we're like i said we're gonna be shooting walking dead till uh till the end of march uh um or or sometime in march i don't know when in march uh and uh whether i'm alive though that's always a <laughs> that's always oh, a question we'll and yeah. um but yeah this uh this cartoon that uh i'm working on which i can't talk about yet is is gonna be super awesome uh but yeah there's some fun things there's fun things coming i'm really excited about the movie and really excited about the final season well i gotta tell you when both of those things ready to hit man, but you you have a home here if you want to come back on and talk about it for sure we'll blow them up as much as you can for it i would love to i'd absolutely love to Absolutely. And where, where do you live? Uh, I live in Atlanta. Um, yeah, this is Georgia. Atlanta. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So sometime I, maybe after I get down, I was in Atlanta mm, right before COVID. I flew down to Atlanta and did an episode of um, uh, Wild and Out with Nick Cannon, <laughs> which, oh, was, yeah. which was a trip. Yeah. If I knew you were there, I would, would have dropped by and uh, spread a little cheer. If you if you uh when next time you are in town though I will have so much cobbler for you. So oh my goodness, not and I will definitely eat it, my friend. If people wanted to follow you or get a hold of you, why don't you give us a shout out to where they could find you? But you're um, uh, uh, Smug Orange S M U G Orange. It's named Smug after a, a pet orange I had when I was 23. We kept it in the fridge for four years. <laughs> yeah, it started it started turning into a tree. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Wow. Okay. All right. So people to follow you, man, I can't thank you enough Coop, for being a part of the show and thank you for being an advocate on cannabis and speaking out and letting people know the truth. It's, it's, it's a truth. I really want people to know more about before they, they just have to realize too much can, can make it unpleasant and, you know, but just enough can, can really just help you vibe better in, in the world, I think. And how, and you've been doing well, you and your family been doing well through this whole COVID crisis. We have been. We're yeah. Uh, my wife and I, and uh, we're really fortunate. But I love living in Georgia, so I have a, I have like a creek and some rock faces I can relax on, and uh, I just get lost in the nature, and we just do hikes and stuff. Well, oh, man, it's great, my friend. Well, again, you always have a home here. Whenever you want to come back, especially you want to be able to let us know what you're doing. And Absolutely. I can tell you, my fans are my my viewers are really going to love this interview. So I got to thank you so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel today. And make sure you guys at home, make sure you keep tuning in to Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments. Thank you.